Okay, so Lisa, I want to thank you again for coming on the podcast today. I'm really excited to talk about your book, The Art of Psychic Reiki. Um, <laughs> there are so many reasons why. So I think this conversation will really be um, enlightening for a lot of people and speak to a lot of people who felt maybe alone in some of their experiences. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Yolanda. I'm super happy to be here and I love your show. Thank you so much. Well, this is one of the things um, this morning when I was thinking about talking to you, I was like, one of the first things I have to ask you just to get it out of the way, the word psychic. So a lot of people have like a trigger with this word and I've noticed it sometimes because they're afraid of what it means or sometimes it's afraid of not being enough. Mm. So can you just share with us what psychic means to you? Sure. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is a word that has a lot of triggers for people. And there are a lot of people that think that psychics are bad or evil, kind of, you know, connected to witchcraft, right. or maybe they think psychics are charlatans, you know, like hucksters and frauds. And certainly there, there are, there have been some of those right. in both those categories. And, um, or psychic is something that's like not believable. It's like, you know, beyond our rational explanation. Um, and, and I think really what it is, like, I really actually love the term, the old fashioned term ESP, mm -hmm. because I feel like, you know, our, our brains process sensory data, you know, and the average person can process maybe 10 to 15% of the, all of the sensory data that's coming in, all of the sounds and feelings and smells and everything. We, we learn how to narrow our focus so that we can pay attention to what's happening in the moment. Right. And my theory about this is that psychics learn how to expand the amount of information that they're processing. So they're taking in more sensory data and they're processing more sensory data than other people, you know, and um, I think that there, and there has been quite a lot of, you know, research, scientific research that proves that people, that being psychic is normal, natural, part of our sort of ev evolutionary process. I'm not sure we would have evolved if we hadn't, if we didn't have this gift, mm -hmm. you know, that, it, that almost everybody has it. It's like a muscle. You can strengthen it if you want to. Some people have more of a gift than natural gifts than other people, but really anyone can learn how to do it. Um, so, so I, I have, I have to ask you this. Just to clarify for people then, because some, there is some confusion about the difference between intuitive and psychic. Yeah. So yes. Can you just clarify? Sure. Yeah. And I do make a distinction about that in my book. So, mm -hmm. um, so in intuition is really like our inner knowing, you know, it's like our own senses of knowing. So and if you know anything about the chakras, it's really the first three chakras, what we feel in our body, what our emotions are, how we feel like I have a good feeling or bad feeling about it. That's the second chakra. And then the third chakra, which is, I don't know why I know, I just know those senses are really what make up our intuition. And I believe that's our own inner knowing, our, our ESP, like our extrasensory perception, you know, perceiving the world around us. Psychic is a little different. Psychic is when we get information from outside of ourselves. And that's when we're talking to guides, Reiki guides, spirit guides, angels, beloved ancestors who have passed over. And, you know, I think that's what's more triggering to people because not everybody believes in that. Um, and I, I don't know if I would, except that I experience it all the time, you know, like I, I actually res respect psychics. I think, um, skeptics, I think being a skeptic just means you're thinking for yourself, you know, yeah. and I don't know if I would believe in, I keep an open mind, but I really believe when it happens to me. Yes. So that's yeah. another interesting thing about your story. So people who've listened to the podcast know I started with Reiki and then that opened up my intuitive yeah. Um, awareness, which we're going to go deeper in with talking about your book. But with you, you were psychic and then Reiki followed. So can yeah. you share just what that experience was being a psychic and a counselor, I want to point out as well. And then yeah. how did you even move into Reiki? Sure. Yeah. So I, I grew up outside of Boston in the 60s and 70s. And I was one of those I see dead people kids, you know, and it was really I grew up in a haunted house. And I just, for my whole entire life, I can remember seeing and experiencing and feeling things other people didn't feel, you know? Um, and mostly I learned how to, you know, I spent the first 20 years of my life trying to figure out how to turn it off, how to train myself. There, back then there weren't new age bookstores, there weren't podcasts about this topic, there weren't psychics on TV, there was just having to be quiet about it. So you didn't end up in a 
in a psychiatric hospital if you talked about it too much, you know? So I kind of kept it on, on the QT and tried to figure it out. And it was, I, I really started working as a psychic when I was 19. So that was my first entry into this world. That was like in the eighties. It was sort of the height of the new age. And all of a sudden, it was something that you could do, that you could talk about, mm -hmm. which is so exciting for me. And I studied with quite a lot of good psychics who are teaching um, psychic development. So I, I started working as a psychic, and that's when I wanted to study counseling and psychology, because at 19, I really could only deliver a message. And then my clients would cry, or they would be upset. And I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to do now. I want to, I want to, like... How do I handle when they're when they're having a feeling? Right. That's when I studied counseling and psychology, and added that into my repertoire. And maybe about you know a four, four or five years into that, it's probably more like ten years into that, I really started noticing that my psychic vision was opening even more. So I would sit with my clients and I would see the energy and they're moving in their energy field. I would see things happening in their body. And I wanted to understand what that was. You know, I wanted a way to access the energy field in the body. That's when I, um, that's when I started Reiki. It was 1999 that I learned Reiki. <laughs> I heard about it. One of my friends was like, oh, that's happening to you. You should try this crazy thing called Reiki. <laughs> so I did it um, really so I could understand what it was I was experiencing. And, and I mean, I think as healers, for, for me anyway, I wanted to work mind, body, and spirit, you right. know? And this really, Reiki allowed me to get into the body and also into somebody's energy field. So for me, it's like a perfect, and I think when we're really dealing with deep soul issues, we need to look at all of those angles to really do deep healing. It's really interesting, something you pointed out, and I think your book speaks to this as well. You had this natural psychic ability, mm -hmm. but yet yeah. you studied to understand and you know refine this ability yeah. that you had just naturally and that's what um i think of a lot when i think of reiki you know it's like we're natural it's our design we are um able to sense energy we're energetic all of these things but we learn how to manage these aspects of ourselves that we weren't told about right so mm -hmm. that's one of the things i wanted to ask you about as well just like you mentioned these two they really go hand in hand and while it's not talked about honestly in a lot of reiki classes and then people start having experiences of awakening to these natural designs, but then don't know what to do with it. So yeah. I wanted to ask you that, like, why did you write this book and who is it even for? I just want to show it again. It's so pretty. Oh my God. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> my, my publisher did such a nice job with the cover and is really, I'm so happy with it. So I, what I noticed, um, thank you. It's such an awesome question and a great topic. Um, what I notice is that people, you know, so many of the things that we do these days, like yoga, Reiki, meditation, open us psychically, you know, right. and that right now where we are in the evolution of humanity in this energy shift that we're in right now, people are waking up anyway. So all the sensitives are becoming more sensitive. All of the psychic people are becoming more psychic. All of the healers are being called to the table to you know, pursue things, um, to pursue healing modalities and to learn. Thank God. I think this is such a beautiful thing that this is happening, right? So there's now more than ever, people are exploring these worlds. Yes. And there's something about which all of those things will open us. If we have latent psychic ability, they'll open us further. And I, I see that those things are, are whether if you're an empath and, in, and a psychic, which by the way, all empaths are psychic, never met one that wasn't, okay? Um, so an empath, psychic, sensitive, are I think these are all the tools of healers. You know, they're, we have them for a reason. And when we develop them, they um, are greatly benefit the people that we're working with. If we can learn how to master those skills, you know, mm -hmm. and especially, um, so Reiki 1 will really, if you're an empath, will really increase your sensitivity, your natural ability to feel what other people are feeling in their bodies that's physical empathy and to feel what they're feeling in their emotions that's emotional empathy and what you know people were having these incredible experiences in my reiki classes and so i was having to teach them how to manage their energy as part of the training mm -hmm. and it's so needed like it's it's hard to work doing reiki if you're overly sensitive and you don't know how to manage that 
Yeah. And it's not hard to manage it. You just have to learn it sometimes, you know? Yes. And then Reiki 2 really opens people's psychic. And I think it's because the Reiki 2 attunement and the Reiki symbol, the Reiki symbols, especially Seihei Ki, really opens the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is the part of our brain that really connects us with these higher visions, the sort of the more psychic um, capacities that we have. So, you know, I think I, you know, we talked about this before and I told, I tell a story in my book about working with this very talented Reiki healer who was backing away from Reiki because she felt like it opened this psychic part of her and she was really scared. She, she's like, I don't want to do that anymore. It's overwhelming. I'm scared. It opened something for me and I got to stop it. And I was like, wow, that can't be like the world needs all the healers it can get. She's a fantastically talented practitioner. Like I got to do something about this. So I really started teaching them together. Um, and, you know, after years and years of doing that, wrote a book about it. Mm-hmm. That's, um, there's two things, because I want to uh, talk to you more about the energy management, because that's something that I speak about all the time. I highly, you know, I can't emphasize <laughs> that enough how important it is um, yeah. for all of us, right? No matter if we're healers or not, just across the board. Yeah. But while you're saying this, um, I have to go back to and mentioning this again, because there is this, you know, stigma around the idea of exactly like the story of the person you told, like, oh, something's opening up, I'm becoming more aware, and it's uncomfortable. And that's the thing. So we have this one side of what we've been taught, and a lot of um, fear has been, you know, passed down to us about what it means to be able to tune in and sense what's non-physical. But I would ask everyone to really think about how we're doing it already, right? Like the times where we walk in a room and we can feel the tension in the room or all of these ways that we sense what's not in physical form all the time, but we just don't attach the label to it of identifying that these are part of our, you know, intuitive or psychic gifts, this um, ability to perceive what's not in form. So I wanted to ask you about that too, just again, so that people aren't in fear if they are already and that they don't beat themselves up or even put too much pressure on themselves of being psychic enough, intuitive enough. So in the work that you do, have you noticed that it is, you know, like a very individualized thing that people have? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like how people start coming online? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about psychic, you know, and mm-hmm. I think that a lot of it comes from watching psychics on TV. Yes. You know, that we sort of, have, or in the media that we've, we have this in our mind that it's this big dramatic thing, you know, like some angel comes down and blows a trumpet in your ear and you have a vision and you fall on the floor and you're like, you know, having a seizure, so, like twitching. I don't know. Like we have these kind of extreme visions about what it's like and that um when i teach psychic development to people one of the first things they say is oh my god it's so much easier and this is that i thought it's effortless this has been happening 16 times a day since i was five like it's um you know it, it's so interwoven into who we are that's we don't even really notice it that's right um that's how i find it and it's really like about dropping our expectations about what we think it's going to be this right. is a hard thing to do. Um, and showing up for what's happening in the moment, paying attention to what's happening in the moment, um, because it is natural. And I, I think lots of people who are very sensitive psychic people had bad experiences when they were children or had experiences that frightened them or their parents, you know? And a lot of times, like the first topic that I talk about when I teach is fear. And we have to work through our fear. And people are afraid of seeing bad things. Uh, I'm going to see more bad things if I don't keep the door shut. All I'm going to see is bad. I'll be crazy. I'll go crazy. People think I'm crazy. <laughs> like there's that, you know, um, fear or, you know, it's the devil. It's, it's evil. And really sorting through those things and seeing like where you're stuck on that. And if you can let it go, because it is, I don't think that God gives us gifts we're, we're not meant to use. Mm-hmm. I believe these are God-given gifts, um, that they come from the light and that they're here to help us navigate through our life, to align with our life purpose, 
and to help our clients, you know, especially when we're doing healing work. You know, when you say that, one of the first things that comes to mind is like, okay, if you're already in this realm of doing energy work and energy healing, there's a part of you that's already acknowledging that there's an aspect to you that is non-physical. Right. And you've probably already had experiences of, even if it's just feeling energy, again, like in your field or in your hands. So, and this is what actually um, took me into studying intuitive development outside of, you know, my Reiki classes, because I wanted to understand what I was feeling and sensing. And I, I wanted to be able to translate it because without understanding it, it was just annoying, you know? Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you about this energy management, which you highlight in the book as well, because we're all taught a lot about our physical management, mm -hmm. right? But then here's this big part that's so important, especially for people who are so sensitive to energy and are highly empathic. So could you tell us about the energy management portion and um, what I thought was so interesting is how you highlighted that people who are empathic often feel called to do work to help other people, but then on the flip side are overwhelmed by it. Yes, it's a terrible catch-22. Mm -hmm. And I think that it creates a lot of depression and anxiety in empaths. Right. You know? So it's our basic function to serve, you know, to be of service, to want to help, to be healers. And I think we're all empaths are called into healing work in some way, you know. How, if it's not Reiki, it's something else. And right. yet that puts us right in the line of fire. That means that we're going to step into people's stuff or go volunteer in the hospital or go teach in the school or do we're going to do something, you know, and feeling the call to do that. And yet being unable to handle what happens when we're in that environment creates a lot of depression and people like it drives people crazy when they can't figure out how to live their life purpose, you know? Right. So, and fortunately the energy management practices are difficult. It's really a lot about changing a habit. So empaths have a habit of being spongy so that outside the energy field that we have, the aura that extends beyond our physical body, for empaths have a slightly different energy field. That's normal for them, right? So an, an empath has a, a more expanded field. A non-empathic person has their outside edge of their energy field stops really right about arm's length out. And an empath often has a much bigger field, sometimes mm -hmm. twice that size. And then the outer edge of the energy field, which in a non-empathic person is more solid like a bubble, in an empath, we have a sponge, you know? So it's really difficult to go into a tough environment like a high school or uh, a hospital if your field is twice the size and it's a sponge mm -hmm. because you're going to leak energy, you're going to sponge energy, and that uh, creates something called empathic overload when we just, it sort of blows our circuits. Right. We feel dizzy, lightheaded, tired, exhausted, anxious, cranky, mm -hmm. you know? And if you think about how you feel sensitive, you think about how you feel when you get home from work or after you're on the subway or 20 minutes into Walmart, you know, like it, that's, it's that, you know, the feeling, you know, yeah. and it's, so it takes a little bit of learning how to pull our field in. And, and fortunately, this part of us responds really well to our imagination, to yes. visualizing, to our intention, right? So I use a combination of visualization and breath techniques. To, so you imagine that you pull your field in a little tighter. You imagine that your energy field is more solid, more like a proper bubble. You take a deep breath and you, you, know, you breathe in the top of your head and you breathe into your heart and your belly. And on the exhale, you release anything that you've picked up down the grounding cord, which connects us to the earth. So it's basically grounding, being in the body, clearing. What, so if you're a sponge, you're going to wring out the sponge, you know, mm -hmm. and um, filling so filling is when we replace our lost energy and then um changing the habit of being spongy to the habit of being a little more solid and it's a little like taking your energy field to the gym and working out right if right. we do it on a regular basis over time it gets stronger and we change the habit we have of being spongy and porous and leaky <laughs> to be it sounds so appealing doesn't it <laughs> um to being more solid to more how non-empathic people are and then the world is easy then the world is no problem and other people you know we can really step into our power which is to be mm -hmm. there for other people so i have to ask you this too because i know um a lot of people who are very empathic when they hear this sometimes they're afraid of like wait is that going to mean i'm not going to care does that mean like 
my compassion is going to turn off. So can you just explain, like, I, I, I love this topic because um, it's one of those things where people who do see this almost as like a burden and it's so uncomfortable, right? And then it's like, no, this beautiful thing that you can see what a gift it is. So can you talk a little bit about that of how it doesn't turn off your compassion? No, it doesn't. And, you know, a lot of people when I, when I especially the really sensitive people, they're, they're, they ask, make it go away, turn it off. Can I give, if it's a gift, I want to give it back, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and and yet, I would say the exact opposite happens, Yolanda. Like, when we have a good boundary, we can be even more compassionate. Right. You know, the more grounded we are, the more solid we are, the more, co- you know, strong we are in our own self, mm-hmm. the more we can step into people's um, issues or really be there for them to to be present, you know? And I, yes. I feel like presence is like the, that's the thing that we're, we're really looking for as healers. And yeah. The more grounded you are, the more you're, you're, you know how to do these things, the more present you can be. And I'm so glad you said that. And it makes me want to, I want to ask you about the handling emotional release, which is so important. Um, but I also want to mention that you do have an online class, like a, for a yes. training for empaths, right? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd really love everybody to come and check it out. It, it's a free class and it's four hours of uh, basic sort of learning how to manage your energy for empathic people, you know, and mm-hmm. talking about boundaries, talking about ho- how, you know, how you hold your own in relationships because empaths are often drawn into very sticky relationships with narcissists or energy vampires or whatever you want to call them. There's this continuum or polarity that we have empaths on one side and givers on one side and takers on the other right Right. we have things to learn from each other so it's not always bad but it does stretch us and so I you know talk about how do we manage our relationships how do we manage our energy what is the full potential of our gifts when we do that it's Mm -hmm. it's um I think it it's not hard to learn but it's really crucial knowledge and vital knowledge I think for people that are sensitive no, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things too that's so amazing about it is I think once people start managing their own energy and start to recognize the like how empowering it is to be responsible of managing your own field yeah. and the, all levels of yourself, mind, body, energy, it also starts to um, free us from that pressure of wanting to fix or thinking we have to fix them because once we see our ability to hold our own space we also then start to recognize that other people have that same ability no that's such a good point and I I love that and you know I think two things happen one is that empaths feel can feel very victimized yes so we can very much identify as a a victim I'm a victim and there's these horrible energy vampires and horrible people around me and the world is out to get me and why did God give me this gift you know Mm-hmm. It, and um, learning how to hold our own energy field can take you from feeling like a victim, from feeling victimized by your own sensitivity. Which right. I've been that way. I know. Like, I've been there too, you know, um, to feeling totally empowered. And when we, it's only when we're fully empowered that we can help other people be empowered, you know. So yes. when we have that presence, when we have our own empowerment and we can sit inside of ourselves and observe what's going on in somebody else like empaths want to energetically merge with the other person and we literally can leave our body like we leave our body and our energy field and we go to the other person like this and it's when we it's the normal unless you learn otherwise it's the normal way that you're going to want to relate to people Mm -hmm. and in the merge that's when you begin to feel uh, responsible for that person you know like i'm my job as a healer is to fix or rescue Here's the really tricky thing, Yolanda. It's I, I wouldn't like want to hold everybody's hand when I say this, is that really we do that because we can't stand the way we feel when somebody else has a feeling. Yes. You know, like if if somebody's one of my kids is really really sad, I can't stand the way I feel. Right. So I will do what I can, all my healer mojo, to make that go away, so I don't have to feel it. Yes. And it seems like it's about the other person and it is sort of, <laughs> but it, it's also, we don't want to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it's sticky. Yeah. yeah. It, we don't want to feel uncomfortable and it's sticky. So we can go into this pattern of, of saving and rescuing, fixing, smoothing everything, over, mm-hmm. you know, so that we don't have to feel it. Right. Well, you know, that's not really 
I mean, it's not, it doesn't really work because people are allowed to have their feelings. We can't, you know, people should be allowed to have their experiences and we can't, you know, as, as healers, when we're really in our core and in our presence as healers, we're midwives, you mm -hmm. know, and that, that image is what worked for me to make the shift from rescuing to he, to being like a more grounded healer. The midwife doesn't have the baby for you. You know, you have your own baby. Midwife doesn't think that they're going to do, there's no way that's going to happen. You know, right. Let me have that baby for you, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not even on, it's not even on the table. Right. Yeah. So when we hold that, like we can't have a baby without a midwife. Maybe it's really helpful. We need that support. And that's when we become very powerful as healers. That's when we, you know, we can really um, create change in our clients without take, having to take a bite out of us too. So we've, there's, this leads in, it's a perfect segue to what I wanted to ask you about next. And I just want to, you know, show that you've already really highlighted for us the importance of how understanding our psychic and intuitive abilities, it helps us to understand the experiences we're having for ourselves, but even when we're holding space for other people. But there is that other layer of um, how we hold that space, which you do talk about. But I want to say, too, one of the things about the book I thought was so interesting is, you know, I, I assumed that the book was going to be for people who are already practicing Reiki. But honestly, after reading it, I was like, oh, this is a great resource for people who are just even curious about it. Because you do go into detail about the different levels, um, how to practice, what to expect. I mean, you even talk about what people may experience after their initial attunements, which was, yeah. you know really a lot of people do kind of go into this, like what's happening to me after the fact, but, and I'll ask you about that in a minute, but the handling the emotional release, you talk about this in the book, but you also have this Reiki mastery class for Reiki masters. Yes. That is um, really to help us understand how to hold space. And I just want to say again, you are a counselor and this is something not taught in class and it is absolutely valuable to know in session. So can you talk to us about why you share this? Sure. I think it's vital. And I, what I see more and more that's happening more and more is as energy medicine is becoming more mainstream and more popular. And as people are becoming more disenfranchised with the medical model and the kind of traditional mental health system that we have, I think people are turning towards healers to have their needs met, to, to really do deep work. That's not uncommon. I always say nobody stops by my office because they're having a good day. <laughs> they only come to a healer because they've got a thing, you know? Yeah. And um, they're coming to us with more of their problems, really deep problems, very, you know, strong mental health issues or physical health issues, end of life issue. You know, there, there's just stuff. And we really, um, and I've seen so many Reiki healers come out of like, a, you know, the Reiki master class and sit down for their first client who has something that they're not prepared to deal with some level of trauma that they're like, Oh my God, I, we didn't cover this in class. Like, how right. do we do, you know, how do we do this? So, and I, I, I don't, I feel sad and it's hard to watch people learn the hard way. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, like I, I did. <laughs> yes. I did too a lot. You uh -huh. know, like I had that sinking sensation where I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what to do because I am so over my head right now, you know? Um, and, you know, th that I don't want other people to have that. Right. So, and I want us to all be on the top of our game when we're working with people and we never know what's going to walk in the door, uh -huh. you know? So I think we have to be prepared for, for all of it. And that's why I think it's so important to continue learning, to continue our education, to never really stop learning and um, to skill up all, you know, get skilled, but also to continue to work on our own selves because yes, as we work on our, like healer, as a healer, you're always your first and best client. Mm -hmm. you know? And that it's the healer, the Reiki people that have done the most work that have a line out the door of the clients because we can only go as deep with our clients as we've been in ourselves. And yes. I'm always working on myself. I'm always digging through another layer. Um, I, I'm always getting my issue du jour coming in with my clients, you know, yep. five clients that week with the same issue. I know it's my issue and I've got to work it. I, there's two things that you said. I'm so glad you bring up. Um, definitely the inner work and the continuing our education. Another thing that I 
talk about all the time because it's so important. And I think it also takes the pressure when you can admit I'm still learning. I'm still in my practice, regardless of these titles that we have, you know, it takes the pressure off of us of thinking we're supposed to already be perfect and healed all the way or, you know, whatever that is. And that we have to know everything. I think it's very freeing when we can admit that like, yeah, I'm still learning, I'm growing, but also giving yourself that opportunity to know that there is, it doesn't stop. No, it doesn't. Right. Yeah. One, one of the things that I do is I run a supervision group. Um, so I have like five or six people in the group. We meet once a week. I mean, once a month and we go over like, um, I had this client, I didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And I was totally triggered when this happened. And I got completely in my own stuff. And I got off my center. And, you know, we work through it, like, like, um, as a group, you know, and yeah. supervision, if you can, if you have an active practice, you need, you need to be in a supervision group or have a supervisor, a, a person that has had a lot of clinical experience or, or, you know, a therapist, a psychologist, who can help you continue to learn and grow on your own it's the best way to keep growing and learning I like that and that's the second part I wanted to say is you mentioning how some people learn the hard way and that's what happened to me because Mm. from classes because this isn't talked about there's this you know assumption that people are going to just come lay on your table and then they're going to go and it's Mm -hmm. like oh no uh no (laughs) people have you know the energy starts moving people have emotions come up people come in and have things they want to share before they even get on the table so it was kind of shocking and you know admittedly I was one of those people very introverted very sensitive to energies I was happy in my own little bubble you know so this work in so many ways I mean it really made me have to step up and like work through my stuff so I could hold space but I think it is such an important conversation because there are a lot of people that have no idea that this is, know. you know, what's going to happen. Definitely um, what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, no, really, truly. Yeah. So could you tell us uh, just a little bit about the Reiki Mastery course, mm-hmm. um, especially too, because I know you have a live Q&A for people who are in that course coming up this month. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I have a, this class is just starting right now and you can still jump into it if you want. And it's a six week class webinar class. Um, and in that class, we cover things like how to manage uh, your energy at even more, you know, even more expertise level, right. what to do with difficult clients, how to set boundaries, how to work with, you know, specific issues around transference and countertransference, which most people, psychologists learn it, but Reiki people don't learn it. And that's what happens in, in the interaction between uh, a, a client and a Reiki practitioner when the Reiki person, when your client is projecting on you or how you feel about each other is part of the therapeutic process. Mm -hmm. Um, Also talking about um, difficult specific situations, clients with addictions, clients with mental health issues, clients with extreme physical health issues or end of life, you know, Um, working with kids, working with teenagers, like all these kinds of things that are, that we encounter, um, and, and, and so I really break it down and go through all of these different scenarios that, that I've had. I counted when I was publishing my book, I thought like how many sessions have I done? And it's somewhere between, it's like 16 or 17,000 individual out client hours over the past 25 years. Wow. Yeah. So I have a very, you know, strong clinical background in, in this and, and I want to share what I know. Um, what I learned the hard way yeah. um, with people so that so that we can all be more powerful and um, I just because I see it every day people are getting called on to step into these places with people that that's for real I mean it's stuff is for real it's not yeah. you know uh, one in one of the classes I cover things more of the psychic like things like what do you do when you have a client that has maybe an entity on them or um, a negative learn attachment. the hard way too. <laughs> oh, yep. And that's no fun to learn the hard yeah, way. Right. <laughs> you right. know, it's no fun when you bring it home with you or you're just scared out of your mind or, you know, mm-hmm. um, all these things. In, and that's sort of a daily, if not weekly occurrence for me that I'm pulling things off my clients. And, um, and that was a bit of a shock when I first figured that out and you get to a certain you get your hands on enough people and you get your psyche going enough and you really start seeing those things. So, so I go into kind of more advanced psychic self-defense in this class too, to how we, how do we manage the really nitty gritty stuff? 
I want to say two things with that. One, I have to say, because again, I know people have fear of like, oh no, I don't want to say anything bad. But the truth is, I mean, listen, I was afraid of like, if years before I did this, if you would have told me tarot, I was like, no, there's the devil card in there. Like, I'm terrified. What do you mean? You know? And one thing that really does happen when you start learning how to manage your own energy and you do work on yourself, the fear dissipates. And like, even when you have these experiences, yes, there's like, of course, you know, like the initial like, oh, but then when you remember that the ability you have and that you're in your power, it's just so different, you know, and yeah. I can't emphasize that enough. And what's so funny is, you know, I tell people like, you know, especially if you're an empath and you are so uncomfortable just to go to Walmart, to the grocery store, whatever. Imagine what life would be like if you could go in those environments and feel more comfort in your being, just that alone. Totally. And it's all sort of the same thing. So, you know, a lot of it's about setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. So when we can set boundaries with, uh, with whether it's a person or a place or a spirit, it's all the same. That skill mm -hmm. can be transferred to any of those, you right. know, uh, uh, situations, whether it's Walmart or, uh, uh, you know, a person who, who's trying to take your energy or a spirit. Yeah. Once we know how to really set a boundary, it, that, it works in all of those. And I, I think for me, it's like you, um, um, like knowledge is um, what makes me not be afraid. Yes. So, you know, the more we know, the less we need to be afraid. It's the unknown that we're afraid of. And in, in a way, like the, I don't know how to say it, I don't want to scare anybody, but it's like the most danger you're in is when you don't know and you have a ton of talents mm -hmm. and a ton of ability and you don't know anything. Right. You know? That's when you're really at the most risk. I think of it a lot as like being street smart. Mm -hmm. You know, the more street smart you are, the less danger you're in. Right. And, um, and there's being street smart in the psychic realm and also in the people realm. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to learn both sides of that. How are we going to be street smart? How are we going to learn how to navigate these and be strong in these environments? Because when you are, I... Um, I never wanted to be afraid. Like, I don't like to be afraid of things. So I always, I'm slightly counterphobic. And that means when I'm afraid of things, I lean into it and do it until I'm not afraid of it anymore, you know? Yeah. And I, I remember being like a kid and being like, I'm not, I didn't come here to be afraid. Yeah. So I, I learn and step into it until I'm not afraid anymore. I've always been that way. Um, well, you mentioned this earlier and it's funny. It's reminding me now of an example of this. You mentioned earlier how, um, this work also helps us to have more compassion and a bigger heart rather yeah. than shutting down. Yes. And you know, the truth of this is that when I was sensitive to energy and didn't understand and didn't know how to translate what I was sensing, I was so critical. I was so mm -hmm. judgmental. Mm -hmm. You know, they're bad. I don't like them. Ew. Uh, you mm -hmm. know what? I, just, you know, and you think yep. of how many people we do. We're like, they have bad energy and I just don't yes. like them. I don't want to be around them. But then once you start this work and you do understand what you're sensing in a non-physical way, oftentimes you see what you thought was bad energy was someone's hurt or what you thought was bad energy was like, you, you just have more compassion and more understanding and the judgment even starts to fall yeah, away. And I, I think that that's huge. That. That's huge. I love it that you said that. And I, I think like as, as healers, we attract people that need healing, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and it's just like a magnety kind of thing. Like it's resonance, you know? Right. So where we draw to us people. And that's why people stop you in the supermarket and tell you their story or, you yes. know, um, whatever, like all the people like your friends sort of hover around you when they're not feeling great. Because when you have a soul of a healer, that's what you're radiating and that's what you get back. And again, like seeing if you don't know and you're like, oh my God, those horrible energy vampires, it's like, get those, you know, people out of my, out of my face. If you just see them as somebody that is wounded and doesn't have a great boundary. Right. So really, and you said this already, but I really want to bring it up again. It is on us to hold our boundary. Mm -hmm. Nobody can and will do it for you. Right. Nobody cares about your boundary. It's in everyone's best interest if you have a terrible boundary because they're getting <laughs> they're getting you know energy free lunch from you. You know, right. and 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 so we that's part of the empowering process. And when we step out of becoming a victim, and we realize that, well, okay, so it's on me to set my own boundary. Once I really understood that. Mm -hmm. that no matter where I was, I was in charge of my boundary. I stopped being afraid of the world. Isn't I wasn't afraid amazing? of places. I wasn't afraid of my clients. I wasn't afraid of my own gifts. 
I wasn't afraid of, of spirits. Like, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I don't have to tell you that there's negativity in the world. All you have to do is turn on the news, you right. know, and you know that this is a world that's sort of half shadow and half light. And our job as healers is often to step into the shadow. Um, that's what we're meant to do. And once I got it that I'm in control of that and I can decide that I don't want to take my work home with me and that I don't want, you know, leave it at the office or whatever I'm doing. I just, I just don't, I didn't feel afraid anymore. What a relief that was. Yes. No, it's such a beautiful thing. And I want to talk about the guides um, as well. And there's two things in this one where you were mentioning earlier that you have people that you meet with and they have this space to be able to share what has been coming up for them and their struggles. I was thinking of um, how thankful I am now that there are more, you know, spaces like this, even, you know, podcasts and you have a podcast too. I want to talk about as well, because when I started in this, there really weren't that many resources outside of some books, but not where you could talk with people live about, you know, what you were experiencing. And I think community is so important in this because this is how we learn. But I, I point that out because one of the things too, that made me smile about your book, I've um, studied with several different Reiki teachers and I know you have too. And as you know, you learn different things from different teachers, whether yeah. it's their teaching style or just what they're passing down. Yeah. And when you learn different styles, you will find that it all comes down to energy healing and all of these various techniques, they all work pretty good. You know, like there isn't just one way, right. but um, so in reading your book and some things that you shared too, I was like, Oh, Oh yeah. I didn't know that particular mm -hmm. thing or, you know, didn't yeah. hear it from that particular perspective. I think that's why community is huge too. Cause we're all learning about this aspect of us. And I think the more conversations we have, the deeper we'll all go in truly understanding this and not being so rigid about it. Yeah, I, 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 me too. I'm a very collaborative person and, you know, um, there are an awful lot of psychics, especially our territorial and non, you know, non wanting to collaborate with other people. But I, I feel like the more we collaborate, the more we talk, the more we share information, um, the more we all, you know, everybody benefits that way. And right. my hope is always to, um, to see that and to sort of come at it from a non-ego standpoint, you know, like whatever. And I don't mind if my students practice with other teachers. I want them to learn as much yes. as they can from me and then go and study with somebody else. Mm -hmm. I still study with other people. Right. Why wouldn't you want to, you know? Um, I don't know. I just feel like that's, you know, I have a I have a beautiful Facebook group that I would love to invite everybody to called Psychic Reiki. It's on Facebook, and um, it's a pretty beautiful community. And I I'm in there um, at once a week teaching. I do Facebook Live videos. I write blog in there. I just teach whatever I whatever kind of soapbox I'm standing on that I wanted to talk about. I wanted this week I'm going to talk about ethics because I feel like that's another thing that doesn't get taught. Like. Yes. How do we behave in an ethical manner, especially as psychics? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I, I don't know. I just think that we can support each other. And I know a lot of really great communities and people that do offer support. Yeah. Um, more and I more, start, it's, it's happening. Yeah. I started a, a Facebook group as well as an extension of this show for that exact mm -hmm. reason called the yeah. Seeker Circle. And that's exactly why. So yeah. people can have spaces to talk and learn from each other and support each other. But yeah. um, please make sure um, I want to include the link for your Facebook group in the show description as well. Sure. So people yes, can so. find it easily. Yeah. So here's another um, interesting topic, the Reiki guides. Now mm -hmm. I will say in my experience, it's like, kind of 50 50 half of my teachers talked about the Reiki guides half of them didn't half mm -hmm. of them talked about guides in general half of them didn't yep but as we've been talking about today a lot of people start to um become more aware of what's already present anyway <laughs> when we start tuning into our own energy so you mentioned Reiki guides in the book actually you break down all different types of guides in the book so I wanted to ask first of all um why you think this information is important to share and how it may support us in our practice. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, I, I think because of my orientation as st starting as a psychic, it was yeah. just something that I, I was already part, it's part of my everyday landscape, you know, and the Re Reiki guides are just, um, 
you know, these spiritual beings, they're non-physical spiritual beings that come around to help us. And I, of all the years I've been teaching Reiki, would just hear my students say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing Reiki and there's something else here, you know, mm -hmm. or um, of like who hasn't felt the invisible hand, you know, when you're, right. when you're like, how many people hands are on my body? Or um, <laughs> when you're, you're I, I couldn't believe it the first time I felt that when I, I knew there was only one person in the room with me and I felt way more hands than that on me. I had to open my eyes and look and see who came in the room and there was nobody there, you know? Right. And this is a very common experience. And having, um, as people's sensitivity awakens and their psychic awakens, they just become aware. And so why I think we should talk about it because it's already yeah. happening, you know, and that's what I, why I bring it up in, in the book. And I also feel like it's a, you know, powerful, it's powerfully beneficial for not only us, but for our clients, if we can learn how to re receive information or pass a message to somebody or, you know, just know that we're, we've got assistance when we need it. That's one of the things I love that you pointed out to um, very specifically in talking about guides, because it's something also that I learned kind of on my own, but I thought it was important to share is that they can be so helpful in helping us learn. Yeah, that's what I loved uh, or do love about working with guides is I, they really do help you to learn. But you mentioned that in the book of making sure we have that awareness and not have an expectation that they're supposed to make our life decisions for us. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think some people do think like our guides are who we go to. to go, like, should I go left or should I go right? Like right. what? Red shirt or blue shirt? Right. You know, mm -hmm. like. Um, and I, I don't think that that's empowering. First of all, they don't really have the ability to, to do that. There are, there are kind of rules around it. And one right. of the rules is they're not allowed to interfere in our free will um, or to do our, take away our lessons, clear our karma from us. Just like if you have a kid, you wouldn't do your kid's homework and they right. wouldn't get any, you know, a good grade on the test. It's the same kind of thing that, that they will, they will assist us, but they're not going to kind of bail us out of the, trouble whatever trouble we've gotten ourselves into um but they are like that um you know the phone call <laughs> the phone call from home that you can you can get to give you the hint or clue or yeah they guide, they guide us and i i love kind of a practical approach to this so i like to teach people how to tell what channels are already open on them what if, which of their psychic senses are open i'm a visual psychic but it's the most rare and a lot of times people think they're not psychic because they're not a visual psychic. Mm -hmm. um, but what, like maybe you're an auditory, maybe you hear, put your hands here. Now move your hands here. Now just stay here until your client, you know, like cries or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever you're getting. So we may get, or me feel like you're a feeler. So you're going to feel like what to do and know. Um, and, and then what, what our guides do is if, especially if we ask is they'll often combine when we're learning um, we get a we get a hit, we get a psychic hit, and then we'll see as signs and omens in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. So we can learn to work to read signs and omens. To some people get numbers, some people see, you know, synchronicities and coincidences. Um, I, I'm a big fan of learning divination tools. You talked about the tarot mm -hmm. or the pendulum. Like I like the pendulum. Um, it can be the I Ching, or there's so many different kinds of divination. Right. Divination helps us speak direct it's like a bridge between us and our guides you know and it's a powerful tool to help us develop our connection so i like my students to get the hit and then look for the sign in the world get the hit look for the sign in the world you know or pull a card or see whatever it is that they normally see and that those kinds of very practical experiences build trust mm -hmm. and communication and connection between us and our guides yeah. And you know, one of the things I love about this too, and I'm so glad we're having this conversation again, because it's not talked about all the time, you know, and I talk about it on this podcast all the time, but it's not talked about <laughs> all the time. And I'm, I'm so happy um, that you have this book and are having this conversation, but it also makes me think of how when we do allow ourselves to be an acceptance of our gifts, which you also talk about in the book, we also learn to be led and taught even just by the universal life force energy itself, mm -hmm. you know, and it's one of those things that's, I guess it's hard to explain because it sounds strange in the language that we have, but you really do learn from the energy and through the energy itself. 
Absolutely. If you're willing to, you right. know, and I, I, I think that our guides and our own intuition is how our own soul directly communicates with us. You know, it doesn't have a way to communicate with your mind. Your, our minds can't do that. So it comes through our feelings, through our intuition, through our connection with the guides, through signs and omens. So we all want to be more connected with our soul. We all want like to be guided through life. I mean, life is tr tough, you know, yeah. and we, we benefit greatly when we allow our soul to, to guide us through the, through our intuition. So there's a huge payoff, you know, in um, kind of our quality of life or our ability to connect with our life purpose and what we're meant here to do when we, um, when, and you know, I, I've spent a lot of time working with CEOs of fortune 500 companies. You'd never know, but they, I do. And, that they like that kind of thing. And I can tell you some of the most powerful people that I know and the most successful people that I know have this very strong intuition and yes. um, use their intuition to guide them through their lives. So this isn't only something that sort of uh, uh, us fringe dwelling healers use. It's <laughs> like celebrities and CEOs and people of, you know, all kinds can benefit from this kind of. Yeah. But yeah, again, I mean, we're work. designed for it. And yes. that's the thing. Like, it's like, you're designed for it. It's almost like, you know, we have these different layers to our makeup. But again, I mean, for so long, we've only been given like a partial manual to like part of our design, but not the entire system. Right. So yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's so exciting. And I want to um, ask you about this as well, because I think it's so great for everyone to have, you know, various resources for information for this exact reason. Could you tell us about your podcast, right? The Miracle of Healing on Empower Radio. What do yeah. you talk about over there? Oh, it's so fun. So just last night, I recorded my 100th show. Congratulations. Thank you. It was kind That's of a, a lot. It's a lot. I know. I did, I've done, I did, I've done 100 shows. So it's been a couple of years that I've been doing it. And, um, and I wanted to really connect with other healers. So I talked to people about um, whatever kind of healing modalities they have. And some of it's, it, it's, there's all different kinds. You know, last night I had a physician who's a functional medicine doctor. Um, I have, you know, energy healers or people who studied near death experiences or people who have lost loved ones, you know, yes. um, all different kinds. And that's, so the conversation is really about healing. How, how can we, and all the different modalities and practitioners and styles of healing and experiences of healing. Um, and, it, and I like a miracle story. So I kind of focus on like, well, what, what's been miraculous about what you've experienced, yes. you know? Um, so you can find, it's called the miracle of healing. You can find it on empower radio, which is an internet radio station, empowerradio.com. It's also on every normal podcast channel, you know, like Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and iTunes. Okay. Probably all the same places your show ends up. Yes. We're all over. I mean, and again, like so exciting that um, I was thinking about the other day because I say sometimes, like, I'm glad we have these conversations because it's coming, becoming more normalized, but I'm like, but it's already normal. I think it's being more um, accepted, you know, yeah. and uh, it's a, very exciting time where people are starting to question more and allowing ourselves to follow these curiosities so that we can't understand. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is allowing ourselves to be curious enough to try to understand ourselves, like our own mm -hmm. design, you know, and stepping out of the fear and what we may have been told and really investigating for ourselves what's true. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. it's, a, it's a very exciting time. It really is. So I want to show your book again, The Art of Psychic Reiki. And can you tell everyone where we can get the book? Amazon is uh, it's always good there. And I think most of the book outlets have it, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, um, mm -hmm. you know, any, any of the normal places where you buy books has it. Yes. So. And then your website. How can we contact you and learn more about your work? My website is lisacampion.com. I'd love for you to come there. And, um, and I also will give you guys a link for this free energy management training for empaths. Um, but come and check out my website. I do do Skype readings and phone and Skype for people from all over. Um, and I have a lot of classes listed. I'm always teaching something, you know, psychic development, Reiki, um, all kinds of all kinds of stuff. So check it out on my website. I have a lot of free resources on my website too. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to make sure to um, put the link again, of course, in the show description, and we'll make sure that we have the link to your Facebook group as well. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, Lisa, I'm so glad that we met. I really enjoyed your book and this conversation. So thank you for being here today. It was my pleasure.